I want to thank all of you for coming. I know that it wasn't easy with this uh, nasty cold weather out there, but you're here, so that's good. And uh, we're going to be talking about um, the excavation project. I haven't been there for quite a few years, but I can kind of update you on uh, things that they have found and, of course, our experiences when we were there. But this is also kind of a, a general um, overview of what an archaeological dig is like. Um, not all of them are the same, but um, I can at least share with you the experience that Sherry and I had. And Sherry is here for just a few minutes, and she's got to go do her real estate stuff. So um, if she leaves, then we talk about her, you know, as she's walking out the door. So um, as we've advertised it, um, this was a presentation in anticipation for people uh, to learn more about archaeological digs and um, the potential of next year going on a dig at Tal El Hamam. But I've got good news and I got bad news. Good news is that uh, Dr. Collins uh, emailed me from Jordan and uh, he said this, he said, we have a wealth of raw data that will take us eight to 10 years to publish in a multi-volume final report to which he then added, I'll be 80 by the time we get that done. The bad news is, he said, this is our final season. I mean, this month they are wrapping it up. So there will not be a dig in 2024, which breaks my heart. Um, and the reason for that is, I won't go into all the, the uh, explanatory language that Dr. Collins gave because it was pretty private what he was sending me, but basically the Department of Antiquities in Jordan um, is reached the point of being so corrupt and, what's another good word I could say, um, inefficient that Dr. Collins is done trying to do a wrestling match with them. So um, that's kind of why it's ended. So we won't be going, won't have the opportunity of a dig in 2024. We're working on something else though that you uh, might hear of where you don't have to do international travel. And I've got leads on at least four or five different uh, venues that we might be looking at possibly in 2025 to, to do a dig. So um, I'm bummed because I was, I was really getting pumped up for it. But we're not going to have that opportunity, but there is an amazing story of Tal El Hammam. So first of all, what is a tall tell or tell with one L, two Ls? Um, the reason it's spelled different is in Arabic, it's tall, and in Hebrew, it's tell. So a lot of times we hear tell. Uh, tell Aviv is, is probably the most common one that you know about. Um, but uh, these are designations of just a large mound that looks weird. So uh, this, is, this is a picture of Tal El Hammam. Uh, it's massive in size. And when you look at it, it's like, okay, that just doesn't look like nature produced this. It looks kind of man-made. And the reason it looks man-made is because that's exactly what it is. Um, so what happens is you'd build a city and then an earthquake would happen and the city would collapse. And then the people are still there. So then they rebuild on top of that. And then an, an enemy army comes and destroys them and they shake out the rubble and then they build on top of that, build on top of that. So they just keep building up and up and up and up. And, and so what the archeologists do is they start at the top of the tell and they go down. So literally, archaeology is destroying the tell as they're going down. Um, so they are very um, precise in photographing measurements, uh, what's found at different level, because once you, once you remove it, it's, it's gone. And so they want to have an accurate record as they go down. So they're, they're basically digging in a landfill, <laughs> using our language, and, and digging down, and you're starting with the newer stuff on top, and then you'll notice a strata change and move into to different um, periods of, of uh, the, the culture of the people. And primarily what they're looking for is, is pottery. And I've got a bunch of 
uh, pottery up here. Uh, and you might go, how in the world did you get that out of Jordan? They don't care. Uh, they don't care because this is what's called surface finds. In other words, they're laying on the ground. And I kid you not, it's, it's not like you have to you know, get a, a microscope out and be looking for this stuff. You're tripping over this stuff. It's, it's absolutely everywhere in Tal el Hamam. Um, but they're useless because uh, for archaeologists, they need a depth. They need uh, a, a pure, uh, undisturbed area to be able to determine dating as they're going down. So stuff you find on the surface, it's meaningless. Uh, and, and most of it's on the surface because <clears throat> uh, a farmer has been plowing it and turning over the soil and, and up it comes. So they look for all kinds of stuff and, and uh, you see the different colors in there. As, as you're digging down, uh, the archaeologists are really uh, interested in, in watching the soil development as it goes along because that also shows uh, different periods and different strata and things like that happening. So what you saw in that gigantic mammoth picture here um, is what is called the upper tell or the upper tall. Um, that's highlighted in blue. Um, so the, the, the city also has a lower tall or a lower tell, um, which is actually bigger than the upper tell. So this, all of it might have um, um, walls around it or definitely the upper tell would have walls around it. Um, the lower tall is where Sherry and I ended up digging um, when we went over there for the first time. And there was a, an area right in the center of the lower tall that they wanted us to do. They, they, they called us a probe. So we were just kind of digging in this spot. And it's a three meter by three meter square uh, that you're digging in. And they, they centered it there down the lower tall because that's where kind of the major population um, enterprise would be happening. And sure enough, uh, we found something of, of modest significance. Uh, we found the walls or the foundation uh, to the temple of Tal El Hammam. Um, and I was there three years and the third year, is when we found the end of one of the, the southern walls. And it was, I want to say, like 41 feet, 42 feet long, which ended up being the largest Canaanite temple ever found. Before that, it was at Hatsor, which was 35 feet. So it's like, cool, you know. I can tell you're all just really impressed, yeah. Okay. So this is a, a kind of a a dramatic view of what the, the tall uh, would look like. The upper tall um, part of it, that portion clear to the very top, is where the palace was located. Um, and, and they've actually found walls with plaster still on. I mean, imagine that. From the time of Abraham, walls with plaster still on. That just blows my mind. I mean, we're talking 4,000 years ago, folks, uh, time of Abraham. And so here's another uh, uh, a view of it. Um, and uh, that, that um, yellow square, which says MBA Monumental Complex, uh, that's what we found. So they didn't quite call it a temple. It's a monumental complex. The reason they called it a monumental complex was the footing was this wide. So just imagine how tall of a building you would put on footing that's that wide. Uh, Lane Rittmeyer, who's one of the leading authorities on Canaanite temples, said you're probably looking at a three to six story temple. I mean, that's pretty huge in my mind for, for ancient times. So this is actually Dr. Rittmeyer's uh, artistic rendition of what Tal El Hammam might have looked like during the time of Abraham prior to the destruction. So there would have been fortified city up on the upper banks and then uh, farming all around for produce to, to be brought into the city. Uh, the tall, as you might look at it and go, wow, that's a very, very uh, even grade all the way around there. How'd they do that? Well, they did that purposefully. Uh, they wanted a grade between 35 to 45 degrees. Um, so the, the slope is like this uh, going up. And if you've got a, an attacking army that's coming and they're, they're going to 
uh, try to do a, a frontal assault, uh, it's a bad strategic idea to do that because in order to go up that thing, you literally have to be on all fours as you're crawling up uh, to get to the wall. And there's some guy up on the wall just smiling from ear to ear, shooting arrows, throwing uh, you know, sling stones at you, and you have no way to defend yourself. So usually um, they would do the siege mentality of just trying to, to wait a city out. So where is Tal El Hammam? Well, I thought Google Maps would be great. So I got on Google Maps and uh, the red arrow is where uh, Tal El Hammam is. It's on the northern uh, part of the Dead Sea, that, that body of water um, down in the lower part is the Dead Sea. Then you see the Jordan River kind of winding up. Um, and then finally you begin to see the, the tall itself from a satellite view. I mean, you can just see <clears throat> how immense this place is by looking at the road running along uh, beside it. There's also um, around Tal El Hamim other talls. Uh, there's Tal Kafrin, um, which had a, a group from Greece that was doing archaeological digging there. Uh, Tal Nemri, and then Tal uh, Blibel and Tal Musta, which were couplets or real close to each other. Um, and so you might ask, well, why in the world were you digging there? Uh, because if you look in biblical maps, I mean, if you have a Bible and it's got um, Bible maps on it, and you open it up and you, and you start looking for Sodom, you'll always find Sodom. I've circled some of the places on some of these Bible maps. They place them clear to the southern end of the Dead Sea or along the eastern side of the Dead Sea uh, a little bit um, north from the bottom of the Dead Sea. Uh, those places, um, Baba Dra is one. I think uh, Nimera is another one. And they found sulfur there. They found... Uh, uh, destruction from, uh, you know, uh, um, some sort of fire event, uh, which was not uncommon for fire events to happen back then. So Dr. Collins, who's the, the lead archaeologist, he was like suspicious of all these other sites. Um, and and uh, he thought, you know, maybe, maybe to to figure out where Sodom is, is, maybe we should start with the Bible. I mean, that is a radical revolutionary idea, right, to, to start with the Bible. Because the Bible, I mean, the Bible is, is very clear on geography, usually, uh, because this area is not that big. I mean, if you've ever been to the, the Holy Land, the state of Nebraska is almost like the Holy Land. I mean, it's, it's, it's that small. So for him, he went to Genesis chapter 13. And Genesis th chapter 13 is that narrative when <clears throat> Abraham and Lot had become so prosperous that they had too many sheep, too much livestock, too many people to feed, and, and they just, the land wasn't supporting the vastness of their project. And so uh, Abraham said to Lot, we need to separate. We need to divide up. And then Abraham said, what would you like? What, where would you like to go? And, and we're told that they are located at, at Bethel and Ai. And Bethel and Ai, are, they're just a little north of Jerusalem and, and slightly uh, west. So the location of Bethel and Ai <coughs> is the, the triangle point I guess it would be this way on the, the slide. And so Dr. Collins thought, okay, what can you see from Bethel and I? Well, you can't see Baba Draw and you can't see Numera. I mean, there, there's abs even with binoculars, you couldn't see them from that location. So it says that Lot lifted up his eyes and he, sh he saw that the Jordan Valley, that's how it's normally translated, uh, was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So in Hebrew, this, this phrase Jordan Valley really is not to be translated Jordan Valley. That's not what it means at all. 
Um, it's called Kakar Hayardin. And the Kakar is like a round disc, like a, 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 if you think of unleavened bread that's cooked on a, a, a stone, that would be a Kakar. Um, if you describe the shape of a coin, you would use the Hebrew word kakar. So kakar basically means a circular disc. So it's saying that Lot looked down and he saw the kakar of the Ha Yordin. He saw the circular disc of the Jordan. Well, that's a weird thing to say about a river, right? Because rivers aren't circular in nature. Well, what happens as the Jordan comes down and right before it dumps into the Dead Sea, um, it kind of fingers out, and it has these kind of little tributaries that go out. And as a result, you end up with a green space um, that, guess what, is in the shape of a huge circle. So Lot is no dummy, right? He's got to feed his family, he's got to feed his livestock, and so he looks around at all the wilderness up on the West Bank, and he says, that's where I'd like to go, down where all that green stuff is, um, because I think I can do really well down there. So it says that, that Lot uh, chose for himself the Kakar of the Har Yordin. And by the way, whenever the Bible refers to the Har Yordin, it's always the Jordan. I mean, it never refers to anything else. And the Jordan River is just located one spot. See a Galilee? down to the Dead Sea. That's the only location for the Jordan River. Jordan River doesn't come out of the Dead Sea and continue on. It dumps into the Dead Sea and there's no outlet for the Dead Sea. So it says he, he went, he crossed over the Jordan. Um, and so now we're dealing on the Jordanian side and we got the Kikar. So we're dealing with an area that might be eight miles by 15 miles really, really tiny area. So Dr. Collins said, well, what's in there in that, that area that might make sense as far as being ancient Sodom? And there is a tell there called Tel El Hamam that is so huge that you could bulldoze all the other, that'd be a really bad idea by the way, but you could bulldoze all the other talls together and they still would not be as big as this place. So during the time of Abraham, Tal El Hamam was like New York City. Well, what does the Bible describe as being the New York City of his time? Sodom, right? So, the identification of Tal el Imam became very interesting for the archaeologists. So just to kind of back up, uh, who's digging there? Well, it is um, Trinity Southwest University College of Archaeology. That's where Dr. Collins is. Also, the Veritas uh, University out of California, <clears throat> of which Dr. Collins is also associated, uh, and then the Department of Antiquities in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Um, the, the Jordanian aspect was one that always just kind of amused me because we're, we're digging with Jordanian archaeologists and there are Jordanians that are hired uh, to help us with some of the physical aspect. Um, they're all Muslim and the Torah or the, the Quran says that Sodom is upside down underneath the Dead Sea. So here they are digging with us in the site where we believe the Bible says this is where Sodom is, and they're getting excited about what they're finding. And it's like, ah, uh, you know, um, one, one of our good friends from the dig, uh, Hussein, who's an uh, archaeologist, um, to this day I don't get it. He's, he's on Facebook all the time. I mean, I think he's got it open like 24-7. Um, and if I post anything, he's almost like one of the top first likers of whatever I post. And I'm like, um, is your English that bad or don't you really care or what? You know, because I'm you know, lifting up Christian, Christian stuff. Who, another fun story is Hussein was taken by my wife. I mean, who wouldn't be taken by my wife, right? I was taken by my wife. Um, but uh, Hussein t said to her one day, um, I have all kinds of nephews and they need wives, and I want them to have wives like you. Do you know women like you? And, and Sherry said, yeah, I know a whole bunch of them. He said, you do? And she said, they're all Christian. And he went, oh. 
But there was not animosity. I, I, never, I never felt any animosity whatsoever with the Jordanians we were working with. <laughs> the Jordanians were funny, though. They told us, we love Americans, but you got to stop listening to the Jews. And we said, okay. And then, you know, just kind of went on. Um, one of the fun things <clears throat> was uh, while the dig was going on, um, they would dig for like a three-month period from January to the end of March, um, and every day they would send out uh, email updates on what they were finding that day or what they were doing that day, and they'd send some pictures of what was going on uh, that particular day. And so, um, like, we were on the dig a long time ago, but every year it was like reliving the event all over again with these updates, and so they were really good. So, uh, being a volunteer at the dig, uh, this is my wife, um, and she's holding up a tiny little jar. She didn't actually find that tiny little jar. Someone else did. Wasn't that a, one of the dolmens, I think, is where they found um, that. And, and uh, Tal el Hamam, what, what made it such a great dig is there are a, a lot of archaeological digs that you as a volunteer will go, and your job is to dump the dirt bucket. Yay, I paid, you know, how much money and flew there. Um, they, they give you the tools. You go through like a two-hour orientation, and then you are an archaeologist, you know, and you're there. Each, each square had a supervisor who was kind of watching what you were doing, but they allowed you to get into the dig, and that was so much fun. So flying over, uh, the biggest cost was just the air transport getting over there. Um, some people uh, were nervous about, you know, flying into um, a place like Jordan, you know, wouldn't there be uh, terrorist threats and all that kind of stuff. I've been told, uh, Lauren, you can correct me on this, but I've been told the two safest airports to go to in the world are in Israel and in Jordan, that the security in those two places is through the roof. And, and uh, I can verify that that is true when we... Uh, were leaving Jordan, it was when I was over there with Micah and Holly, uh, there was, I think he was American, I don't know, but he, he made just some slight comment about a bomb. And we never saw the guy again. I mean, he disappeared, and we don't know what happened to him, but they weren't, they weren't monkeying around or messing around with any of that. So this is a picture of the airport in Amman, which is where you fly into, and uh, it, it, was, it was a nice airport. Then uh, the place that we stayed uh, was a place called the Moven Pick, which was right on the Dead Sea. And the Moven Pick originally was a, a Swiss hotel and uh, really gorgeous and beautiful inside, uh, food that was just to die for. And uh, the scenery wasn't too bad either. I mean, this is what you would see looking out your um, window if you were on the, the Dead Sea side. Uh, they had a one of those endless pool things, you know, that just, just kind of made it look really cool. And I remember the, the first night there looking across, and, uh, uh, you know, we were in Jordan, but we'd look right across the Dead Sea, and there's Israel right there. So the lights there, <clears throat> lower lights are Jericho, and then the upper lights are, are Jerusalem. Um, and I don't think Bethlehem is in there, but just to the... Uh, the uh, south a little bit was um, the lights of Bethlehem. This is just, I mean, you just try to imagine this. This is coming off worshiping with all you guys for Christmas. And then I go and I'm looking across the Dead Sea and seeing the lights of Bethlehem going, oh baby, this is uh, just pretty cool, right? So the, the endless pool, you're looking out in the Dead Sea, and, and people... Um, and Sherry and I did this too. We one day went down to the Dead Sea, and there are people, this, this just grosses me out, but uh, they roll around in the mud by the Dead Sea. They, they coat their body with the mud because supposedly someone told them sometime that it's all therapeutic for your skin and your body and your internal system. It'll draw out all the toxins and you'll never die or something. I don't know, something like that, you know. And so they got all this goopy stuff on them. And then to get it off, you either use showers, which they had showers right there. You know, you can pull the string and wash all the mud off. Or you can go down into the Dead Sea. Well, the fascinating thing is you go down the Dead Sea 
and because of the high salt content, um, floating is not optional, it is automatic. I mean, I don't care if you are the worst swimmer in the world, you will not sink in the Dead Sea. As a matter of fact, it was hard to walk around because it kept wanting to flip you up onto your back and have you float. Um, and if you accidentally turned or got splashed or whatever, it was like battery acid going in your eye. I mean, the salt content was so high. Right down here on the table, by the way, I encourage all of you to come up to the table after I'm done. Um, on this side, I've got um, chips of salt that we broke off of rocks. So the water washes up over the rocks and then it dries and leaves a salt deposit and then more water hits it, more salt, and, and, so, and there's salt just everywhere, all over the place. And if you don't believe me it's salt and you think it's quartz, go ahead, lick it, it's salt. And you will instantly know it's salt. Right, Mark? He didn't believe me. I mean, that's just, he just had to learn, you know. <laughs> So like I said, the, the first day you're there, uh, Dr. Collins will give you an orientation on Tala Hamam and also give an orientation on uh, what you will be doing as an archeologist. And so um, they'll, they supply the tools and everything. Um, two of the, the big tools that we use, I got them right down here. Um, uh, Sherry and I, the first time we went there, we were like, oh, this is such a wonderful once in a lifetime experience. And on the flight home, we're like, we got to do this again next year. Um, so I ordered our own tools. So uh, I, I engraved in the bottom Tyler 1 and Tyler 2. She's Tyler 1, I'm Tyler 2, uh, just to make all the priorities straight. And so, because those were of high desirability, I mean, they worked really well, and everybody wanted them, and if you didn't have one of those, uh, your digging was going to be much more difficult. So, um, we would usually eat breakfast real early. Come on in! Um, we'd eat breakfast early, and... Uh, like, I don't know, 6.30, 7 o'clock, something like that. Uh, usually load the bus by about 7.30. Uh, sometimes, depending on the size of the group, sometimes it was a van, sometimes it was a bus. And from the Moven pick, it was probably 10, 15 minute drive uh, to get to the dig site, so it was real close. Um, and while you're on the, the bus, uh, usually they might have a devotion or something like that, or just kind of talking about different things. Usually stopped at a gas station and you could get ice cream or snacks, things like that. And that's when uh, the people that I thought were Bedouins, but I was corrected, they were not Bedouins, they were gypsies, and you don't talk to gypsies. They would usually just kind of Kalam right on to you and try to sell you something that they were making at an extravagantly inflated price because they knew that you just had more money than you knew what to do with. So this is a picture of the upper tall um, from kind of the, the loading area when we get off uh, from the, the bus. I was so glad that we did not dig on the upper tell because I would have spent probably half the morning trying to regain my wind after climbing up that thing uh, to actually dig. Um, on the upper tell, though, uh, if, when you go up there, um, there are um, cutouts, like, I don't know, six to eight cutouts, where you could see a bulldozer just did a number on the top of the tell. Um, and they were for artillery, and all the artillery is pointed right at Israel, because there was a point back in the 80s, I think, maybe 70s, uh, when uh, security and concerns were rising. And so Jordan was convinced Israel was gonna attack. And so they, 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 they dug in artillery pointed right at Israel. Well, they dug right into the, the archeological stuff. And I discovered that archeologists are really funny because they go, you know, bulldozers are bad. You don't, you don't use bulldozers when you do archeology. span And then, then you talk to them later uh, in private and they go, oh man, that bulldozer, that saved us all kinds of time. Uh, we're gonna discover all kinds, you know, so, so publicly they say one thing and then in their hearts, it's totally different. They really like bulldozers and would like to use them. So um, all of our uh, uh, material, all our tools and, and everything, uh, they were stored in a mosque uh, right by uh, the tell. And so every day we'd have to go and get all of our tools and then you'd carry these tools for about a mile walk uh, to the dig site. 
Um, I can't remember this guy's name, but he was a character. Uh, didn't understand a word he said because all he could speak was Arabic, um, but he was a character. He owned the mosque, and I didn't realize this. Mosques are like family-owned, and so that was his family mosque that we were storing our stuff in. And uh, he, he always uh, told us he was protecting our work. Well, just look at the guy. Yeah, not much protection there, right? Um, and it's so funny because this is, I think, in January, you know, and it's like 75, 80 degrees. So we're out there with short sleeve shirts. He wore that coat all the time because the man was freezing to death, right? Because it's so cold. It's 80 degrees outside. When you get off, um, uh, the first thing the archaeologists would do was you'd have a bucket or two uh, full of pottery shards. Um, pottery shards are basically broken pottery. Um, and the, the archaeologists would look at them and they would read them, document the ones they wanted to keep, uh, the ones that were meaningless or uh, had no value, uh, or they saw had no value. Um, they got thrown into the pottery shard dump. So there's a big pile of pottery shards just right there as you get off the bus. So if you don't want to bend over while you're walking around, because they're everywhere, um, everything in that dump was stuff that, that the archaeologists didn't want. And it kind of surprised me that um, uh, the Jordanian people, they didn't really care whether you're taking out broken pottery and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so you'd end up um, gathering up some pottery if you wanted to. And then, and then like I said, you had a, a walk, of, you'd walk about uh, a mile or so. And as you're walking along, there's a, a field of eggplants over here and, and maybe a field of corn over here. And, and, and uh, where Sherry and I were digging on the lower tell, um, the reason no one had dug there before was it, it was a banana field. And, and uh, the guy rotated his crops that year, so he didn't plant anything. So we were able to dig in that location. This may be too graphic, but the banana field is also where the restrooms were. Just use your imagination. Um, but you didn't want to go too deep into the banana field because the guy would show up with his shotgun, which made us go, that's kind of overkill to, you know, protect your bananas. And so we were all convinced that a little deeper in that field was a different crop that was being raised that was not bananas, that was more valuable and might warrant a shotgun. I'll let your imaginations run with that one. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, lean to the person next to you and say, what is he talking about? So in archaeology, um, Dr. Collins' phrase was, you want to dig in the right place, and you want to be looking for the right time. And in order to determine that, you look for the right stuff. And so, um, again, this is some of the tools the archaeologists use. These are way more refined than the, the tools that they let us podunks um, uh, dig in. So this is us digging at our square. That's our square supervisor. Um, shoot, Tom Winder, that's his name. Um, and uh, it was Tom and Sherry and I, and a lady by the name of Esther, who was from Albuquerque and was a Navajo Indian. Uh, and with the name Esther, uh, one year she tried uh, during our break day to go into Israel, and she was held in, um, uh, I don't even know what I want to call it, their, their security department because they believed that she was an Arab and had the name Esther, which really ticked them off. And she said, no, I'm not. I'm a, I'm a Native American Indian, which meant nothing to the Israel uh, security team. And so she sat in security for two hours trying to convince them, no, I'm not a terrorist uh, with a name that ticks you off because Queen Esther is held in high regard, you know, and, and how dare an Arab have the name of our queen? <laughs> She's like, no, no, no. So, so that just kind of made me go, you know, I think I'm fine just looking at Israel from here and not spending a whole day trying to get across the border. So um, once, once you start digging down uh, in that square, by the way, uh, I think Sherry took that picture, and that's my hind end sticking out there. That's one of my favorite pictures of me over there on the dig. Um, 
uh, you'd, you'd lay out a line uh, with string, um, but the string, you know, eventually it starts drooping or people might trip or stuff like that. So as you're digging along, you, you, you start lining the outside of your, your square with stones so that people wouldn't kick things down into the square and corrupt the square. You know, somebody kicks a pottery sherd from the surface down into the place you're digging. You don't want that to happen because you want to be able to, to find um, what's, what's in that data area. So that's a picture of one of the archaeologists and uh, the this, this rock outline of uh, some of the squares. So as you're digging that, that square, that six by six square, um, it, Dr. Collins described it as you want to dig so it's like a bathtub losing its water. So everything is going down at the same level, which is really hard when you find something and, and you go, ooh, I want to I wanna unearth this, you know, and you just want to dig a hole right here. No, you, you, you got to just keep going down because they want to see the strata, which helps them in the dating process. So even though uh, you, you found something in one corner, you'd still got to keep digging the rest of it at a real slow pace. And you can just imagine using these tools. I mean, people talk about using a toothbrush. You don't have a toothbrush. It's more like a broom this big. I mean, it's, it's to brush things off. And, and, and you have a trowel. Trowels are very uh, important tools as you're digging as well because uh, not only are you digging down on the ground, but you're also giving a, a good cut on the side. Um, and the archaeologists actually come and they tell you if you got a good cut on the side or not. So that was one of my, my goals was to just have a pristine cut where everything was just absolutely perfect. So I don't know if I ever did or not, but that was always my goal. So um, I found some rocks. Yay. <laughs> right? It's funny, as you're digging, you know, you think all you're going to find is pottery or bones or stuff like that. No, mostly what you find are rocks. But that doesn't mean the rocks aren't important. As a matter of fact, the rocks that we started to unearth ended up being the foundation of this massive Canaanite temple complex. Um, so that's an, another shot. Um, the second year, we had a, a guy by the name of Alex. He was 82 years old and worked me under the sun. I mean, he was amazing. Here's another shot. This is, I think, in a domestic area, uh, a housing area. And so you can see uh, the stone wall structure uh, going up along the side. Uh, you can envision the doorways and everything. Every noon, we had the exact same food. Uh, it would come in these uh, styrofoam uh, takeout trays, and it was chicken shawarma and some salad and orange pop or root beer. I think those are the two options. I don't know. Um, and, and the chicken shawarma was so good. Now, I don't know if it's because the chicken shawarma was so good or I was so hungry. And one of the two, or a blending of both. Uh, but to this day, I've never eaten chicken shawarma that tastes as good as the chicken shawarma that we ate in that uh, uh, takeout tray. Here uh, is an image you can see uh, the discovered pottery. Uh, there's a big vase sticking there. The handle is sticking up. Can you all see where that's at? Um, and, and a smaller vase just up uh, above it a little ways. And, and again, you, you find that and you want to go, oh, I want to dig that out, I want to dig. No, you got to do the slow thing. So that's why uh, you can see that everything around it is going down at the, the same grade level. Uh, here's another uh, pot that was discovered. And you might go, how in the world did they carry that pot? I mean, all they could do is get their little tiny fingers in those side holes. Those side holes were for leather straps. So they would, they would tie leather straps in there, and then they'd hang it around their head or over their shoulder or something like that. Uh, I told these guys it's an ancient backpack is what they discovered right there. Uh, the fun thing is you're digging. Um, it's open grazing area for sheep. And so you might be digging, digging, digging all along. Here comes a shepherd with his sheep. And the sheep, they just go right down into where you're digging. You kind of got to get up out of the way of the sheep, and they just walk through your site. And then after they're gone, you have to deal with the sheep deposits that they might leave in your spot. As you're, I mean, this is farm ground. This is where we're digging. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Esther again. 
all of those boulders that she's kind of sitting on there, that's the foundation. That's not a floor. That's the foundation for the walls uh, of this temple. Uh, here's another shot. You can see that they got down pretty deep here. They're down about 12, 13, 14 feet probably. Um, this is actually Hussein, the guy I was talking about earlier, uh, holding up a, a pot uh, that was found at a dolmen. And as you're, as you're digging, you end up filling up, they call them goofas. They, they look like some recycled tire type thing, uh, but it's just basically a rubberized bucket with handles on it. And, um, and you'd fill this up with dirt and then um, there were guys, I mean, you sometimes had to carry your own goofa, but sometimes there were guys that weren't digging that were uh, like day laborers, um, that were Jordanians that would come and, and carry your goofas for you. Um, these guys were, were amazing. I mean, they were, they were so friendly, so helpful. Um, and, and some of them were older and some of them were younger. And uh, we, we would have to stop every now and then uh, because in, in, in the Islamic faith, um, they have times of prayer. And you can always tell when the times of prayer are because uh, they, they blasted out um, on loudspeakers. And it's like, and I don't, that's not what they said, but that's kind of what it sounded like to my non-Arab speaking ears. Um, and then as soon as that happened, uh, they are done working, and we stop working too out of respect for, for their religion. But the older guys would have their prayer mats along. They would roll them out facing east toward Mecca, and they would spend their time in prayer. The young guys, the young uh, Jordanians, would sit on the mound of dirt from all the goofas that we had and smoke cigarettes. I thought, wow, that's... Kind of similar to what we got going on in Christianity today. Some of the younger generation not engaging, right? Um, and so I found that fascinating. Uh, here's another image of a pot. You can kind of see how this one is all broken up. This is probably a grain jar um, located in, in one of the storage areas or in one of the homes. Uh, this is something actually my daughter Holly found. She got really excited about this. Um, they determined... Um, we have forensic people there too, either medical doctors or um, people that teach anatomy or things like that, because we do come across bones and they need to analyze what are these bones. And this was determined that it was a jawbone of a ram, to which my daughter was all excited that she found something that had been sacrificed to some Canaanite deity or something like that. Um, and, <laughs> And uh, one of the archaeologists said, yep, that could be right, or it could have been somebody's lunch. We don't know which one it was, because it's just kind of there. I had mentioned the dolmens. Um, this is actually a picture of the dolmen, or a dolmen. They're all over the place, uh, up in the high country, high country, going up the hillside. And a dolmen is basically uh, a stone here, a stone here coming up, and then a table stone going across the top. And this is a burial location. Um, the interesting thing, they've never found a skull in any of these burial places. So nobody knows what they did with the skulls. You'd find, you, you'd never find a full skeleton, but you'd find some bones uh, of, of a person. And then they would bury with this person important uh, uh, things that they cherished in their life, right? I mean, what a strange practice. Yeah, we still do that today, right? I mean, you, you come to a, a funeral and you'll see a body in a casket and, and there's a card or they're dressed in Husker attire or, I mean, something, you know. Uh, we, we still do that today. Um, and so uh, these are spots where they call them night raiders or tomb raiders will hit, and, and they're looking for gold and silver and all that kind of stuff. They could care less about the pottery. Uh, for the archaeologists... Uh, some of this pottery is amazing because it is undisturbed, not broken, not destroyed, and so um, you're able to do some dating with some of the dolmens. When they find bones, uh, there's a reburial that's done uh, according to whatever ritual or rite. I never saw any bones, nor did we dig in dolmens all the time. There's just one time that we went up, and, and here's some of the, the things that were found 
uh, in that dolmen that we, we saw. There's my wife again. Hold, I mean, look how prist- I mean, these are, these are 4,000 years old. And it's just mind-boggling. I mean, I got stuff I bought last week that's still not in that good a shape. They're measuring, analyzing, cleaning up. There's Dr. Collins um, looking at a piece. This guy was, name was Ken something. He was from Germany. So after we um, get our, our fines for the day, and we dig till about two in the afternoon, something like that, or no, it was earlier than that, like 1.30 or so, um, all, all of the fines would be designated from our particular square. So these pieces of pottery, they knew exactly where they came from. And our square supervisor, their job was, as we found significant diagnostics, to they were to record the depth and everything. If it was a super fine, like some of those jars that we saw, um, we would stop digging and wait for a photographer to come. And the photographer would take pictures and usually had a little grid marker that he would put down and be able to measure size and depth and all that type of stuff. So we bring them back and they go into these plastic tubs. And when we get back to the Moven pick, we would take uh, our, our tub of our findings for the day. And then uh, you take a bucket of water and uh, a scrub brush that you'd use to clean your dishes. And we would scrub all the dirt and stay off of these. Then we'd lay them out uh, uh, to dry. And then the next day, the archaeologists would gather those up and they would do a, a pottery reading. Um, this is a diagnostic room where a lot of the pottery ended up before it was put into to storage. But every day while we're washing our pottery, the archaeologists would gather around a table and, and start doing pottery reading. And so it would, it would go through you know, several archaeologists looking at it to date the pottery, to identify where it came from, uh, and to kind of rebuild a story of what's, what's going on. Uh, Dr. Collins is one of the lead uh, people in, in uh, pottery reading, uh, known worldwide, really. So that's another picture of them. Uh, for a lot of the people, the volunteers, while they're reading pottery, we do laundry. And that's our dryers right there, um, hanging them over the, the banister. You might go, oh, they found Indian arrowheads over there. No, that's a piece of amber that I just thought was pretty cool. And again, what they're looking for are called diagnostics. That's what the archaeologists really want to find. So if you just find a piece of pottery flat or got a little round to it, it's, it's really kind of tough to figure out uh, dating-wise what that is. But the lips of a jar or the handle of a jar were significant. They were, they were what you'd be calling a diagnostics because as time changed, uh, the type of um, pottery would change as well. I mean, we do the exact same thing, right? You don't want grandma's old chinaware. You want your new chinaware, right? You want your stuff. And so that's the same type of thing that's going on here. Now, or it'd break or whatever, and you got to get a, a new type. And, and technology was always changing as far as pottery, and, and it becomes exemplified in that. So here's one of the volunteers um, going through cleaning up a, a piece of pottery. Uh, this lady, she, she had to be in her 80s, 70s, 80s, I think, and she's an artist. So not only do they take pictures of the um, diagnostics, but then they also do artistic renditions of them as well. And that was her job, was to draw a lot of the stuff that we found there. So here's a, a picture of some of the pottery sherds, and a lot of them are like the very things that I have up here. Um, and like I said, we didn't, we didn't smuggle these out of Jordan. They're, I mean, they're just, you can find them all over the place in Jordan. So um, this, is, this is basically what was found. Pottery record and, and architecture verify that the city located at Tal El Hamam was massive and in operation without interruption until the Middle Bronze period. So literally, Neolithic, uh, Calcolithic time period up to the Middle Bronze. So we're talking almost 3,000 years this city was in operation. Um, also, dolmen fields, a huge dolmen field. So basically you're saying big cemetery. So you got a big city, 
Shouldn't be surprised you're going to find a big cemetery, right? Found skeletal remains in the domestic area, which is not where you bury people. You don't bury people in their house. Um, you bury them in the dolmens. And so when you find people or find remains in a house, you have some sort of catastrophic event that happened where they didn't get buried. S something happened that they just remained there. Um, largest Canaanite temple structure uh, ever found. And then Trinitite. Come on, I'm waiting. Hey, thank you, Brett. I was just wondering if someone might ask what's Trinitite. Uh, Trinitite is also sometimes called Adamsite or Alamorogoro glass. It's a, a glassy residue, get this, it's left on the desert floor after the plutonium-based Trinity nuclear bombing tests back in 1945, all over the place in New Mexico. They found this at Tal El Hamam. And when Dr. Collins, they found it on the upper tell. Dr. Collins, when he was telling the story, said his heart dropped because it was a piece of pottery, clearly a piece of pottery, but it had this green glassy glaze on it, which meant it had, it had uh, been a part of ceramic techniques of glazing that they didn't do back then. Glazing of pottery was a development way, 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 way down the road, way into the future. So he thought the site's corrupted. Uh, how are we going to know what any of this is? But what they do is they take a lot of samples, and they're allowed to bring some samples back uh, to the U.S., so they bring them back to Trinity Southwest down Albuquerque. And one of the things that they do is they do boring samples on some of these. Well, this is one that he really wanted to do a boring sample because it was so unusual. So when he brought it in to the geologist, the geologist instantly said, oh, you have a piece of Trinitite. Dr. Collins had no idea what Trinitite was. And the guy said, let me, let me verify. So he did a boring sample. Sure enough, definitely Trinitite. And he said, where'd you get this? And Dr. Collins said, I got it from Tal El Hamam in Jordan. And he said, all the color went out of this geologist's face because he said, this is not naturally produced. This, this, is, this is only when something is hit with such an intense blast of heat like a nuclear bomb. And he said, we have Trinitite all over the place down here in New Mexico because of the bomb tests. If that doesn't make you go, hmm, nothing will. I'll come back to it. So when we weren't digging, which was usually we would stop digging uh, Friday afternoon, we wouldn't dig on Saturday uh, because in Islam, that's a holy day. They have a similar schedule just like the Jews. Starts uh, evening Friday, goes to Saturday evening, and so um, we're in their country, so we live by their rules, and so we, we uh, don't dig on those days. So we go on tours, and so we'll go to different places uh, for tour. Uh, one of the places we went to was back to Amman and got to eat Kentucky Fried Chicken in Jordan. And what the napkin and the box says, the halal, uh, means it's basically kosher by Islamic standards. So you can go ahead and eat chicken guilt-free uh, over there. So that was fun. And Colonel Sanders is in Amman, Jordan. That's uh, kind of fun. Um, so is Taco Bell and McDonald's, and yep, they're all there. Doritos are also there. I got some sweet chili pepper Doritos. I am dying, and I can't find them anywhere in the United States, so I got to go back to Jordan just to get my Dorito fix, right? Um, one of the places that we went was Mount Nebo, where Moses died. Um, and Scripture says that he looked from Mount Nebo down on to the Promised Land. And so this is from Mount Nebo looking right down into the Promised Land. And, and you can see, you can just see forever from the top of Mount Nebo. And from Mount Nebo, you can see Tal El Hammam if you know exactly where to look. Up on Mount Nebo, they had a gravestone. Um, that's my daughter Holly, just to the, the left of that stone. 
one of the archaeologists there. Um, so just imagine, for me, this is, you know, man. Little wonder that the ladies were amazed when they showed up to, to finish Jesus' burial and found that stone rolled away. I mean, that's, that's got to be an immense project by a ton of dudes to make that happen. Another place we went was to Petra. And in Petra, um, uh, you come to this little town. <clears throat> I can't remember what the name of the town is, but I know we went by the Wadi Musa or, or, or Moses' Swamp, I guess might be how you translate it. Um, and then, and then you, you go into this place and you, you pay for entry into Petra, and then you go through this gated area and you go, okay, where's Petra? And then you start walking. And you walk 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 and you walk, unless you decide, I don't want to walk. I want to ride in one of these carriages, one of these horse-drawn carriages. So people that had a little more money than they know what to do with, uh, they rode these little carriages. And as I watched them, I thought, I'm glad I'm walking. Uh, these guys would need their chiropractor as soon as they're done. That, I mean, they're just bouncing up all over the place, and it's just kind of crazy. As you're walking down this trail, all of a sudden, the walls start getting higher and higher on both sides of you, and, and you're just walking through this, this cavernous area. Um, this picture doesn't really show it real well, but along uh, the, the wall on both sides, as you're going down, there's like a trough running along the wall that is carved in. And this trough <clears throat> is where rainwater or dew runs down, goes into the trough, flows down into a water source down into Petra. Very ingenious, right? And then you step out from these walls, and this is what you see, the treasury. Now, those of you that are big Indiana Jones fans, um, you will recognize this because, was it the second one, uh, the last crusade, or was it the third one? Oh, yeah. Um, here is where Indiana Jones had to go into the temple and kept going and then went through all these different trials and stuff to finally find the holy grail of Jesus, right? And he must have went, I don't know, mile, mile and a half deep into this thing. You go through that doorway and you can walk another maybe 15 feet, and there's a wall. So Hollywood took over from the entrance and created something that doesn't even remotely exist. This is carved into the side of the mountain. It's not that they brought in pillars and stuck them up there. They carved this um, into the wall. And, and that's not the only carving. There's, there's numerous other ones, but this one just kind of takes your breath away as you step out and bam, there it is. So why it was called the treasury is fascinating because, um, you know, calling it the treasury, you would think, well, that's where the treasure is, right? So um, some scholars believe they called this a treasury and they had a few things here, but the real treasury was someplace else. So if you were a robber, you'd hit the bank because that's where the money is. Uh, but the banker says, yeah, we got, you know, 50 bucks here at the bank, but we have 10 million down here, and we don't call it the bank. Got to ride camels for the first time in Petra. Um, here's another little travel tip if you go to Petra. Do not um, pay for your camels when you see the treasury building and ride your camel down uh, into the lower area of Petra. You walk down to the lower area of Petra, and then you get your camel, and they will take you back up. And that's the way to do it. So travel tip. Again, camels are not the coziest ride I've ever ridden in my entire life. They, are, they, they uh, do a test on your back as well. But it's fun. I mean, it's fun to say you rode a camel. Here's some other uh, uh, buildings that are there. This is actually Roman architecture uh, located uh, in Jerash, which is a city just, I think, to the north of Amman. Um, this is, I think this is the outer area of the Hippodrome where they had horse races. Some of you might recognize the lady. Um, that's Norma Fletcher. Uh, she went the second year on our dig, and that's her husband, Terry. Um, it's just so funny. They were, they were digging uh, in a domestic area, and uh, Terry found this, this big stone slab about this big right in this doorway. And so I was always teasing Terry, hey, you found a doormat. Way to go. You got an ancient 3,000-year-old uh, doormat. One of our side trips, 
uh, went to the Jordan River. That's the Jordan River. Um, I have parents, grandparents, that they will bring water back from the Jordan and they will say, can we have our baby baptized with water from the Jordan River? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> I, I know what the Jordan, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not the most, uh, it's not the prettiest. This is from the Jordanian side and you can look straight across and there's the Israeli side. It's, maybe 30 feet across. I mean, you could easily wade across from Jordan into Israel. I would highly not advise it because they are watching all of that very, very closely. Uh, Pastor Megard, when he was in Israel, um, baptized a lady in the Jordan over on the, the uh, Israeli side. So the big question is, which side of the Jordan River was John the Baptist baptizing? Was it the Israeli side, which the Jews claim, or was it the Jordanian side, which the Jordanians claim? I think it's the Jordanians, uh, just from the biblical narrative and, and everything that, that fits. Quite likely, John was not baptizing in the river per se, like it's pictured there. Quite likely, he was baptizing in one of those little tributaries that I say fingered out because the water would have been calm there and would have made a whole lot more sense uh, to baptize someone in calm water than risk your life with moving water. But who knows? It could have happened there as well. So back to the tell. So like I said, um, from the Calcolithic period, which goes all the way back to 4,500 BC, uh, we also found Neolithic stuff there, Stone Age stuff, so it dates even farther back. So just imagine this. This city is in operation from that time period all the way to the Middle Bronze, which is 1550 BC, somewhere in there, 2000 BC, somewhere in there. So, almost 3,000 years, this city is in operation. Have an earthquake, which were very common over there. I mean, the Jordan is basically what they call the Levant, and it is, uh, it's two plates. So they have earthquakes over there all the time. Attack of an enemy army. Cities burned down. This city just keeps going. I mean, it doesn't stop. 3,000 years, it keeps going. All these natural disasters keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. Nothing stops it until Middle Bronze. And it goes out of business, and the archaeological record stops for five to 700 years. There is nothing happening at this location for five to 700 years. Not only that, no one is being buried in the dolmens for five to 700 years. Activity in the burial area stopped totally. Why? There's nobody left. So as they're recording, um, they're discovering melted pottery, melted bricks, blow over where you can see um, stuff has you know, been, been moved dramatically, um, directional debris, directional grains, grains from jars, blown out of jars, burnt in jars, um, directional shards where you see a flow of a destroyed pot moving in a certain direction, and they're all moving in the same direction. What does that tell you? Something catastrophically hit that blew things in a certain direction. And it's blowing all of them in the same direction, blowing all of these different things. So I asked Dr. Collins, what in the world do you think it was that happened here? And here's his hypothesis. And I think it's a pretty good one. He says, I think we, we're dealing with an air burst. Uh, an air burst is, and one of these happened in Russia, I think they call it Tagunska or something like that back in the 20s or 30s. Um, an air burst is a meteor that's coming out of the sky and, and it starts burning up and before it, it hits the ground with, with a physical um, mass, 
it basically totally disintegrates. So what hits the ground is not a meteor uh, mass of, of stone, it's incredibly intense energy. Uh, satellite photos have shown an, an impact uh, circle around Tal el Um And so when it would hit, it would then do this distribution stuff that the pottery and everything else is showing of blowing things along. Not only that, you can see uh, this description that um, they, they basically took what happened in Tagunska and placed it on top of Tel el because that one they could figure out the blast zone because it was much more recent. And they laid it over this area and it incorporates not only Tal el Mam, it incorporates uh, Tel uh, Kafrin, uh, the other three up north, that they all would have been destroyed by this massive, massive fire. It produces incredible heat, maybe along the lines of a nuclear explosion, which would then explain the Trinitite, uh, of such a, a nature of destructiveness that it also uh, presents itself as, um, um, what do they call it, the, the chemicals in the, the rain, what do they call that? I just drew a blank, acid rain, thank you. Uh, acid rain coming down, which eliminates the chance of vegetation. Scripture says nothing would grow there for hundreds of years. Um, people um, uh, ask, well, why didn't people come back there to settle it? And I'm thinking, probably has the image of being a cursed area. Nothing's growing there, so why would you take your livestock there? Plus, is there low-level radiation going on that you go there and you get sick and something? I mean, I don't know. I'm just kind of hypothesizing. But what we do know from the biblical text is Abraham's account. And it says, Abraham got up, returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward the land of the plain, the Kakar that we were talking about, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. Uh, the, the Hebrew literally says thick smoke like from a kiln. So a kiln is where you bake your pottery, and the temperature to do that is through the roof. So, so the, the biblical narrative is saying this wasn't your average Joe fire. This was something above and beyond anything that they could possibly imagine. And the scope of it covered the entire plain, which was unbelievable. So if you want to know more, here's the book to get. And I got a copy of it right there. Uh, this is uh, written by Dr. Collins um, um, and uh, documents a, a lot of things beyond from when we were there at the dig. And... Uh, yeah, that's it. Comments, questions? Yeah. What's that? How close did you guys theorize Sodom would be before you were digging? We believe that is Sodom. Right, right. Um, and, and this is where the story gets even wilder. Oh yeah, we want your questions on microphone because we're recording this one and so uh, your questions will be picked up. So Mark asked how close Sodom is to the dig site. We, we believe that is Sodom. Um, and, and the archeological evidence is affirming. I mean, the, the layer of ash, the destructive character, everything, and it's all, it's the right place, it's the right stuff, all this. I mean, the Trinitite just blows my mind. All those type of things are, are crazy. Um, and. Uh, it's reached the point that there's so much archaeological evidence that's, that's come out uh, that the archaeologists are not afraid to, to declare, uh, we believe we found ancient Sodom. Um, and so it's, it's pretty exciting. Which, you know, <laughs> what, what Sherry and I discovered was the temple during the time of Abraham in Sodom and I thought, if there was ground zero, if there was something God was aiming at with that, that uh, airburst, probably would have been the temple in Sodom. So we were like ground zero of, of the temple, which uh, is mind boggling. Now Marla's got a question, Jameson, thanks. Whoop, he's gotta go throw a switch. 
Not that I have not had any technical problems today. <laughs> Are we ready? Yep, we're on. Okay. Uh, in your particular gig, which was six by six foot or whatever. Right. Okay. And you had to go down layer by layer by layer. Were you starting at the top, Pastor? Yeah, we're starting topsoil, ground level. We went down, let me, let me try to remember, we went down probably a foot before we found the stones. And when you find a stone, you don't dig up the stone. You leave the stones there and you start digging around the stones. And so we, you know, and when we hit stone, then it was like going this direction. And, and, um, and then when you got something, let's say your square is here and you found footing here, but it, it doesn't end here, then you start another square over here. Okay. And, and so you, you add squares, but you document where they're at and, and what's going on in the dig. So what time zone were you in under time frame? We were middle bronze. Pardon? We were middle bronze. We were the time of Abraham. Had someone done it before you? No. Where you started? No. Really? No. So that says something, doesn't it? And there, there are, um, I think the earliest that they, they see evidence of more occupancy is around uh, Iron Age II. Um, there are some Roman remains there because um, Talamon means water, and so they had like a bathhouse or something there. Um, and there was a, a team from our group that was digging in the, the Roman area. We always joked with them that they're digging up the new stuff, you know. Um, just, you know, from the time of the Roman Empire, that type of thing. Um, and, and so, yeah, we, we only, we didn't dig down way, f I mean, we dug as deep as we could, but after a while, you're kind of like, we want to find the edge of this, and then we want to find the length of this. So we didn't keep digging down deep around the foundation. We started going this way with our squares just to try to get some sense of the dimension of this thing. And it was huge. I mean, it was, it was three years that it took us to, to find the end of that thing. Three months uh, each time, so nine months to find how big that, that footing was for the, the temple. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And, and the size of this thing, when we were there, um, we had unearthed less than 10% of 1% of the whole, I mean, it's just huge, gigantic, yeah. Any writing? No, we didn't find any writing. We would have loved to have found the sign that said City of Sodom written in, you know, but no, there, we didn't find any writing whatsoever. Yeah? You mentioned that Dr. Collins has learned some new things since then. Can you give us ideas of what those were? Um, primarily, uh, more pottery shards that, that verify things. I mean, they expand the domestic area. I think um, a couple years ago they went back up on the top tell and were digging in the palace area, um, it, it just recording more and more shards. Um, Dr. Collins told me, he said, we have enough information uh, that will last us eight to ten years just to document, to record, and to uh, be able to write that final document. So there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So if this is an air burst, Yeah, prim primarily the airburst for other areas. Um, I, I don't know if they, like Gomorrah, I don't know if they did that, because I don't think that's an active dig right now. I think the Greeks are done there. Um, and so this is kind of new information that would be interesting to do a dig there to find out. But they've already done some of the digs, so who knows? They didn't record that, maybe, you know. Um, and, the, and a lot of the air burst would have been along the surface, so it would have just been erased over time with wind and rain and all that type of stuff. Um, it didn't reach Jericho, so it didn't get clear across the, the Jordan River because Jericho would be on the Israeli side. Um, that's, that's another cool thing about being at Tal el Hammam because almost every historian agrees that Tal el Hammam is also known as Abel Shatim. And Abel Shatim is where Joshua and the Israelites basically set up camp 
and, and was kind of their military launching station to go across the Jordan to begin the conquest of the land. And the first place that they hit was Jericho. You sit on Tal El Mam, you look straight west, you can see Jericho. It's just, boom, it's right there. So just, this just blows my mind, the irony that God would place his, his people as they're about to enter the promised land and set up headquarters on top of ancient destroyed Sodom. That blows my mind. And, and uh, it's crazy. So yeah, the, the airburst is, I know that <clears throat> I saw a documentary um, and it was put on by a group that had satellite imaging and they're the ones that showed that there was actually, you could see a, kind of a blast zone. Um, I'd have to watch that again to see what, what that ring, how, how intense that was and how big it was. Yeah, Wes. Um, how accepted is Dr. Collins' theory that El El Hamam is Sodom and how much this period? Great question. Um, of course, just like in any academics, some say, yep. Others say, absolutely not. It's, it's crazy. Um, one example was Herschel Shanks, who was the, the editor of Biblical Archaeological Review. And when you think of Biblical Archaeological Review, you go, oh, a bunch of faith-based nuts. Well, they're not. They're, they're kind of like the exact opposite of that. They're secular archaeologists who are digging in the time of the Bible. So uh, Herschel Shanks is, I, don't, I wouldn't qualify him as a believer in Judaism or Christianity, and was invited, I don't know how many times, to come to tell our mom and see what was going on, and always had some excuse that he just couldn't make it. Um, I think it was like two years before he retired as, as editor of Biblical Archaeological Review, he and his wife came and they were just gonna spend a couple hours there. They spent almost an entire day and maybe part of the next day there and were blown away by what, what they were seeing and what was unearthed and what had been documented. So much so that I think they ran like a 10-page article that Tal El Hamam is Sodom, which that's pretty huge. I mean, that's, that's like your top-notch journal in archeology. span Dr. Collins is gone and presented um, in um, Biblical Archaeological Society, BAS, um, uh, numerous times, and initially was, uh, you know, talking about the finds at Tall Hill Mom, and now is confident enough that he, his, his seminars or the, the things that he leads is declaring that Tall Hill Mom is Sodom. There are some that are arguing the dating uh, and it has everything to do with when exactly you think the people left um, Egypt and where that dating is and, and how you date Abraham and everything like that. So that's, the, they, they work backwards and, and there's some debate on what that, what that particular dating is. So that's, it's the talking heads arguing. But I think that's good. I mean, I, I, I think you wanna have critiques and criticism uh, and not just say, oh yeah, it's overwhelming. But for me, I mean, I, it's, it's like I said to Dr. Collins, I said, Tal El Mom is so huge and, and it's in the right time period. If it's not Sodom and he finished my sentence for me, he said, then what is it? I said, exactly. I mean, you, you can't have a New York City and pretend it doesn't exist in any record. I mean, that doesn't make any sense on any level, right? So you, you got this thing that is gigantic and has been there for a long time, and, and the biblical narrative says that's where Sodom was, exactly in that location. You're, you're hard-pressed to come up with what else it could be. All the other sites, the ones down south, they don't have any massive scope. They, they really have no credibility in any documentation whatsoever. So you look like you got a follow-up question. Yeah, they have, are there Say that again. Any, any type of uh, further evidence that progresses the theory, like something that he would say, like, we're looking for this at this point kind of thing. Um, I, I think this airburst thing, the satellite imaging is, is huge. Uh, not every dig has that type of technology that comes. And this was just within the last two, three years that, that they did this. 
Um, I, th I think it's just a further dating of a lot of the, the ceramic work that they, they've found, the sherds and everything, that verifies the time frame uh, of what they found. More destructive elements, I mean, there's, there's massive amounts of ash. And with ash, you know, you, you gotta be careful because, you know, people would cook. I mean, they didn't have electricity, they didn't have gas. You, you, you cooked whatever with, with wood. And then you'd take your ash and you'd dump your ash outside. And people a lot of times would dump all their ash in the same spot, you know. So you find a big deposit of ash, you go, well, could be where everybody was dumping their ash. The problem is this ash is everywhere. It's in the domestic area. It's not where you would normally find it. And it's, it's significant in scope. So that's part of that strata stuff that where they're cutting into the side uh, to see that type of stuff. My eye was never trained. I mean, I looked at it and I thought, dirt, you know. But they got really excited about it. So definitely more trained than I was. So exactly more things they're looking for. I don't, I don't know what that, what that might be. It is, isn't that just funny that the bomb is, or the, the test site was known as Trinity? I mean, that just, I just go, okay, God, you just really have a sense of humor. Yeah, you know, that, that was kind of one of my questions. Why you found one piece of Trinitite and you didn't find Trinitite all over the place? Well, this place has probably been scavenged for a long time and that stuff looked pretty cool. So quite likely you're gonna find jewelry <laughs> all over Jordan made up of Trinitite fragments from Tal El Mam. I don't know, I mean, I'm just hypothesizing. Yeah. Did you find any metal? Find any metal, no. I don't remember finding any metal. Yeah, that's the stuff I dig with. I brought that metal with me. <laughs> no, there's no metal up here. Sure? Yep. Iron? Iron age, yeah. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> yeah, no metal that I can remember. They probably found, well, yeah, they definitely found metal in the Roman area where they were digging. I mean, they, they found coinage and all kinds of stuff in the, the Roman area, but where we were digging, no metal that I recall. Yep, Marla's got another one. So since the, the dig is canceled next year or whatever, do you have an idea where it might go from there? This, this is what happens with digs, is you have someone that's driving the dig, you have funding for the dig, and, and sometimes that person will die, they'll retire, not interested anymore, or they feel they found enough evidence that they just need to go through the evidence. Um, or you got political things come into play, or your money dries up, or whatever. So there's archeological digs all over the place that are, by our standards, unfinished. I mean, the sheer scope of Tel El Hammam, I don't, I mean, you'd be talking centuries of digging before you would, you know, get down to the Calcolithic stuff uh, and, and do a dig across the whole thing. And most archeological digs are not an unearthing of the entire place. I mean, sometimes you have that if it's a smaller place like um, uh, Macaris, which is, um, Herod Antipas's summer home where I believe John the Baptist was beheaded. Um, uh, you, you can actually see the palace, you can see some of the colonnades coming up and stuff like that. Um, but even that, they've not dug all the way down. Um, but it's kind of cool to see some of those remnants like that. Yeah. Do they ever do any coring? Like drilling? Drilling down? The, the, only, the only thing even close to that that I saw um, was they found a Roman tower, and it was clear far away from where we were digging, 
Um, and they just wanted to see how big this tower was. And, and I think it was the Department of Antiquities that was doing that. And so they were digging down around this tower all the way down. And they were down 30, 40 feet, I think. I mean, they had pretty extensive ladders going down there. But <laughs> this is the cold season that we're digging in. And so the snakes go deep. Well, they dug deep enough that they unearthed the snakes. And one of the Jordanians was bit by one of these poisonous snakes. And, and he was lifted out. You know, they drove him to the hospital and everything. And, you know, so I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm going to die on this dig, you know. And not that I dig deep enough to find the snakes. Um, and then, you know, I asked one of the archaeologists, I said, How, how's that guy doing? Oh, he's back. He's down there digging in the, the hole again, you know. And, and so, but it was, it was, I mean, this Roman tower, it was, I don't know, probably 20 by 20. I mean, it was, it was pretty immense. And of course, they're just finding the, the lower part of it. So, but as far as like <clears throat> just digging a probe down, they don't really do that because they got to do the analysis of what they find as they're going down. So, unless you get the bulldozer, that would be the other probe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, you missed the first part. Um, so I, I sent an email to Dr. Collins. He was over in Jordan doing the dig, saying, can I get information on 2024? Because I've got a bunch of people at the congregation interested in going. We're all excited about this. And uh, I was, it was like 1.30 in the morning. I was working on the slides and stuff, and up popped a notification, Dr. Collins, you know, and I'm like, oh, perfect timing. And, and so I started reading the email, and he told me, we're done that this year, as a matter of fact, this week is, is the, the last of the excavation part. Now they're, now they're into the analysis part of what they have dug. And he said it's going to take eight to ten years to get through that. He said I'm going to be 80 years old by the time we uh, reach that point. So he said, and he said there may be small teams, mostly staff and students from the university, that might go over, he said, but I, I even highly doubt that. Um, and the reason for it has to do with the Department of Antiquities in Jordan. And since this is live streamed, I don't want to get into the details. So, yes. Wait for the... It just will blow over. Yep. Yep. It's guarded by the sheep. That's about it. Nope. 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 I mean, we, we are always had talks of trying to purchase the site, and then once you purchase the site, then you could protect it, that type of stuff. So, like, you come back the next year, uh, you might spend part of your time just redigging what you'd already dug because you know, the wind blows dirt in and that type of stuff. Um, so yeah, no, there's, that's, that's kind of the sad part, sad part of the story. Um, so um, I've had a lot of people ask, you know, and were disappointed to hear that the dig wasn't going to happen. Um, and so we're, we're looking at some other possibilities for next year that will be uh, in the United States, so you don't have to worry about international travel. Um, but I've got a line on uh, some other archaeological digs or Holy Land tours um, that we might be able to pull off in 2025, and I just want to analyze them a little bit more and figure out what would work for us. So I'm committed to get back over there. So it, it may be on the Jordanian side, it may be on the Israeli side, I don't know. So. Um, I, I just got to say that going over there changes you as a person. Um, I believed in the Bible before I went over there, you know, 100%. And I came back believing in the Bible 1,000%. I mean, it, it just, to be there, to see it, to live it, to understand the reality of it, it, it's, it becomes something that's not on a written page anymore. 
Um, and so when I'm preaching and I'm putting charts and maps up for you guys and you're like, oh man, here's another chart, here's another map, oh man, uh, I'm sorry, but it just comes pouring out of me because I'm really excited about those sites and those charts and, and that uh, geography because it just verifies so much of the stuff that's listed back there. So, so you'll be hearing more um, as time unfolds, so we'll... we'll uh, pronounce it and let you know what's going on. All right. Thank you, folks. Hey, I said it'd be an hour and a half long. It is now 2.30. It's amazing. It's a God thing. Come up, take a look at this stuff. Uh, you're welcome to touch it. Please don't take it home with you. Otherwise, I can't give any more presentation.